Welcome to Fine Scale Modeler Weekly. Let's get right into it with some new kits. Tamiya has been pushing hard on the 148th scale armor, but they're not the only ones. No, it's Hobby Boss that brings us this 148th scale Panther Ausführung A. Road wheel arms and suspension details are molded onto the lower hull. The upper hull features cutting torch marks, periscope covers, and open engine grills. The separate rear hull plate, well molded road wheels, sprockets, and idlers, as well as various tools, boxes, and hatches finish the hull. The tracks are link in length, and the shirts in are single parts. Bearing similar surface features to the upper hull, the turret has a separate rear plate. There are optional commander's cupolas, including one with a machine gun mount, and the slide molded main gun slips through the mantlet and into an inner mount with a little breech detail. Photo etched brass supplies screens for the engine grills, Decals give Balkan croys and a matrix of numbers for the turret. The color diagrams show two options, a dark yellow and green tank with 741 on the turret and an overall dark yellow tank. This is a relatively simple kit with well-molded details. Should be a quick build. In a prior episode, we looked at Arma Hobby's all-new 148 scale Hawker Hurricane Mark II C. You can see that preview in Andy Key's glowing review at the links in the description. Now, Arma has followed up with the Mark II C Trop, which has the same parts as the initial kit. The most obvious difference with the parts you'll use is the prominent tropical filter intake under the nose. Beyond that, it's all about the decal options offered on the TechMod printed sheet. There are three, including a so-called Hura Bomber based at Assam, India in spring 1944, a desert camouflage South African Air Force fighter in Egypt 1942, and an RAF hurricane named the Mac Robert Fighter, Sir Ian, also in Egypt. Arma is doing some great work and this is a fine example of that. When Star Trek was new, AMT produced a kit of the USS Enterprise that went on to become one of the most successful kits in the company's history. So much so that the company, keen to capitalize on that success, helped with the creation of the Klingon D7 battlecruiser in the show's third season. AMT built one of the filming miniatures and the resulting design became an iconic ship and the kit a favorite. It's kind of a testament to the power that plastic kit companies once had. Now, for the first time since 2011, it's back in beautiful retro packaging. Typical of Trek kits, especially the early ones, there aren't a lot of parts molded in this delightful green plastic. The main hull is split in half and true to the filming miniature is pretty much featureless. The neck is molded with the lower part of the head to which is added the wedge-shaped foredeck and the bridge cabin. The warp nacelles come in halves, and the upper deck section with the impulse engine builds from several parts. Plated plastic provides the engine and cooling grills and the photon torpedo tube. The decals include windows, stencils, and the ship's markings in optional colors. No color directions are given. I've always thought this was one of the cooler ship designs in the Trek universe, and I, for one, am glad this kit's back on the market. Are you going to be building this one? Uh, possibly. It might go well with, you know, some of the other Trek stuff I have. Developed from a sedate sedan, the Fiat 131 Abarth became a potent rally car. Yeah, between 1976 and 1981, Fiat 131 Abarths won 20 World Rally Championship events and the overall WRC in 77, 78, and 80. Italy's new 124th scale kit represents the Fiat 131 Abarth in the Olio Fiat livery used from 1975 to 1977. This kit originated as an SE tooling in the late 1970s and the body is crisply molded despite that mileage. The separate hood covers a relatively well detailed engine and transmission with head and oil pan, pulleys and manifolds, radiator and fan. The underside receives the drive shaft and rear axles, differential, exhaust, springs, rear and front suspension, and wheels with unbranded rubber tires. The platform style interior has detailed side panels, racing bucket seats, roll cage, dash, and controls. Decals supply instrument cluster dials, seat belts, and all of the sponsor and racing markings for the car raced at the 11th Rally of Portugal in 1977. All of the windows are represented by a single insert. Lights are also provided in clear. Italeri supplies the mud flaps in thin black styrene. 
There are even masking templates for some of the more difficult areas on the livery, including the wheel flares. This is a cool subject with colorful markings, plus rally cars need weathering, so that's fun. Look for reviews of the Panther and Fiat at FineScale.com. Where you'll find a bunch of other cool stuff like how-to stories, scale model basics videos, and show galleries out the wazoo. Fine Scale Modeler Weekly is brought to you by HobbyZone USA, your source for hobby storage solutions, hard to find hobby tools, and aftermarket modeling needs. And by Cult TV Man's Hobby Shop, your place to go for science fiction and fantasy kits, decals, accessories, details, and more. And don't forget, you can subscribe to Fine Scale Modeler Magazine, where you'll get six issues a year full of how to stories from some of the best modelers around the world and access to subscriber-only content on finescale.com. Go to this link to subscribe and you'll get a special introductory offer for our YouTube viewers. Pin vices, some people call them hand drills. We all have them and if you don't, you should probably consider picking one or maybe two or like I've got right here, <laughs> four of them up. Now, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about pin vices because I've come across the pin vice that I think is the best of all pin vices that I have ever used. Um, but first I wanted to show you my collection of pin vices from my oldest to my newest and then my favorite up until most recently. Pin vices, if you don't know what they are or how they work, they're basically a little handle and they have a chuck on one end, sometimes a chuck on two ends. And in most pin vices, the chucks are actually what are called collets. And I'm gonna take my oldest one here apart just to show you what a collet is. So a collet, you can see here, is basically four pieces of metal that on the outside have been shaped to match the inside of a collar. And then on the inside, it's basically mostly a cylinder all the way down at the center. And then it's, like I said, it's separated into quadrants. And then what you do is when you put this collar on and you start screwing it down, that those shaped ends move against the inside of the collar to then tighten down and hold whatever bit you're gonna put in there. They're really nice um, and extremely useful, if not necessary, for um, drilling small holes. And you can see on, on this one here, I've got a a smaller collet on one side and then a collet over here that will accept a, a larger bit. On a newer version, like this one, the collets actually come out. So there's a collet there designed to hold smaller bits. That one is designed to hold a, a larger bit, obviously. And then, let me screw that together. On the other end here on this design, that comes off. And then again, there's a collet that can hold, you know, two different sized bits there. So this particular pin vise comes with two collets allowing you to use four different sized bits. And that's a little bit of a generic because you can squeeze some larger bits or into those into those smaller areas but you get what i'm saying what you can do is you use these things to drill holes with micro drill bits i wanted to show you this one because it's interesting it has a uh, a magnet on the back oh. and <laughs> i use it for storage because i don't really use it to drill but i use it to store <laughs> various bits in there anyway and when it must positively, without a doubt, have a hole in it. I got this guy right here. Yeah, yeah, of course I just. But I do, I do bring this along to 
make a point, and that is this is a hand drill, big one, and it has a three-jaw chuck. And this, this right here, to me, that's gold when talking about a new pin vise. And that brings us to the Dispay general purpose chuck hand drill set. Now, I will tell you, when I, when I, I got this, I was skeptical. It was, it was gonna be another pin vise that I was going to add to my collection of pin vices. You know, it's, some of us just like to collect tools. Um, as, as Aaron points out, some of us more than others. But in any case, um, yeah, I was skeptical. I'll admit it. But then I got looking at it. So inside, we've got this little slip case. Aw, oh, thank you. It's one of those, I don't know, it's just one of those touches, right? But any of you who know Dispay, they, they do these neat cases. And I opened up the case, and of course, there's another thank you in there. But then I see this. So it comes with a set of tungsten drill bits from 0.3 to 1.2 millimeter. That's nice. We'll get to this again in a second. And then, of course, this sort of slickly designed pin vise. Now, I'll admit I was it's a little difficult to get the pin vise out of the case. Let me struggle with it here. There we go. So the pin vise comes out of the case. Just like any other pin vise, you know, it's narrow. It's about three inches long or so. But the first thing I noticed was up here. This turns so smoothly. I can't, I, I, I can't express to you through the screen how smoothly this turns. Um, when compared to, say, most recent one, you know, it's basically, you know, you, you rest that end there and then you're able to, to turn your, your pin vise. Or you use it with your finger and you're able to turn your pin vise. And it does the job. It does. No question. This, however, it's just, it's like a matter of quality. You can just feel it. It just turns so easily. So, I gotta say, that was the first thing that I noticed. Then I looked up here, and I noticed that we aren't talking about a collet in this pin vise, this hand drill. It's actually a three jaw chuck. And that impressed the heck out of me. Because what that means is that this thing will tighten down all the way on whatever size micro drill bit you need to fit in there. And anyone who has used a pin vise with a collet knows that those collets oftentimes leave gaps along the sides that it's impossible to tighten all the way down. And if you're using a really small bit, they can, they can go sideways. They won't always stay true and straight. And with this, you're gonna be able to do that. That, to me, that's gold. I really, really like that feature of this Dispay pin vise. Something else that if you guys have been keeping track of micro drill bits recently, you'll know that there have come onto the market a number of companies who are making them and they are now putting, rather than just the drill bit, the same size as the drilling surface, they're putting thicker shanks on the ends of these drill bits. And those don't fit easily into a collet on a typical pin vise. However, on a three-jawed chuck, I'll just loosen that up here, that fits right in there and tightens down very, very nicely, very nicely. And 
Some of you might be thinking, well, okay, it's cool that it comes with these tungsten drill bits, but what if I break one? These are widely available on the internet. So even if you do break one of the drill bits that comes in the set, you can easily replace them. And I had, I've recently bought a set of, I think five of these for less than $15. It was, uh, I, I think 15 is, is really high. So they're easily, they're easily replaceable and they're all going to work with this pin vise. The other thing is, is if you have your older drill bits, they're gonna work with this pin vise too. So I've got a one mil bit right here. And there we go. And there it is. So it's gonna fit. Now the chuck on, on this pin vise, it goes from 0.3 mil to 3.2 mil. So even a 3.2 millimeter uh, bit, if you've got one that is that wide, th it's going to, this chuck will accommodate that bit. So I am suddenly a really big fan of this pin vise. It just feels nice in the hand. It has a three jaw chuck and it just works. It works beautifully. So if you're looking for a new hand drill, a new pin vise, I would suggest looking for one like this Dispay um, that comes with a three jaw chuck. And again, you don't have to get a Dispay one. You can probably go out there and look online and find others. Um, but definitely look for something that has that kind of that kind of chuck on it rather than a collet because it's just worth it. Are you interested in the best models of the year? If you are, that's great and we have you covered because Contest Cars 2023 is available now with photos and captions of more than 500 lowriders, gassers, dragsters, muscle cars, pickups, and more. You're going to see not only the winners, but just the best models that are out there. You can order your copy today from KalmbachHobbyStore.com or go to your local hobby store, bookstore, or a newsstand and pick it up there. If they don't have it, ask them to order it or order it direct from us. Also coming from Fine Scale Modeler is our 100 page special issue paint award winning figures. Inside you will find projects from well known figure modelers like Joe Hudson, Brian Wildfong, Matt Mrozek, and many more and it will be available in March. However, you can pre-order it now on KalmbachHobbyStore.com. So Aaron isn't feeling the best. He's, he's a little under the weather. So unfortunately, you guys have me for the wrap up and that's it. So we're gonna get rolling here, right? A while back, I was in an email conversation with a fellow modeler and they said to me that they didn't know anyone who went into, you know, building a kit looking for a challenge. And I thought, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that. Um, I think there are plenty of us who look at, look at kits and go, oh, you know what, I think that'll be challenging to my, my skills. You know, if we aren't looking for a challenge, how are we bettering ourselves? Well, fast forward to Christmas. When my sister gave me two Metal Earth kits. Metal Earth creates kits out of photo etched steel. And they have a huge range of kits. First of all, they've got a lot of licenses like Star Wars and Marvel and Harry Potter. And they do tanks and they do aircraft and they do architecture and animals and just a ton of stuff. Well, I had never built a metal earth kit before. And on Christmas morning, I sat down and I opened up the X-Wing that she had given me. And I started building. 
five and a half hours later and uh, cursing my sister's name, not particularly Christmas friendly, I admit, but I had an X-Wing that was built. And yeah, it was a challenge. It was a real challenge. And I got thinking, Metal Earth has been around for a really long time. A really long time. So that means that there are people out there who are buying Metal Earth kits looking for the challenge of putting together photo etched steel kits. Well, after I'd finished the X Wing, I'm thinking, how many of us like, head down to the workshop and go, you know what I'm gonna do today? Just for, for skill building purposes, I'm gonna build some photo etched metal. Whatever, I've got this photo etched metal over here, I'm just gonna make whatever it is. None of us. I don't think, I mean, let me amend that. There might be somebody out there who does that, and if you are that person, we want to hear from you. We do. But I think the majority of us, we just, we run across photo etch metal when it's in a kit, and we use it because we have to, or we just want to up the detail a little bit. But after building the X-Wing, I got thinking, these kits would actually probably be good practice for building photo etched metal. So on <laughs> New Year's Day that morning, I built my Millennium Falcon that my sister had given me. And three and a half hours later, I had a kit. They, don't, they go together pretty well. And I gotta say, they aren't going to get you all the way with all the things that you would do with photo etch metal in one of our typical model kits. But I do think it gets you used to the bending, the shaping, and just using tools to manipulate really small parts. So I don't know how you guys feel about photo etch metal. Why don't you let us know? How you feel about photo etch metal, but I would, well, Aaron just, Aaron just gave me the thumbs down on, uh, on photo etch metal. And that's, I know there are a lot of people out there who look at it as, I guess, a, a necessary evil. I'm not anti photo etch metal. And I've found that these kits were, when you look at them, they look like jewels. One word of advice I would give you, if you're, using, if you're using metal tools to assemble these, remember they're steel. If your tools are magnetic at all, you're either having the steel hook to it or pushing stuff away, it's, it can be a bit of a bear. But in any case, I found them both challenging and a good way to practice. So that's what I think. Let us know what you think. If you've built some Metal Earth models, Tell us about it, and I don't know, give it a try. See if doing something like this changes your mind about photo edge metal. Anyway, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye. Let's get things, blah, hang on, let me try that again. 148 scale, that thing. In a prior episode, I'm getting too excited. When Star Trek was new, <laughs> the world was dark. <laughs> Gene Roddenberry said there'd be let there be light. <laughs> My God, this is awful. So much so that I knew where the line was going, but I just couldn't get it out. Just mm -hmm. let it flow. No wonder they just always say WRC. We're going with that, because I don't want to have to try and say that again. <laughs> that, I mean, that was pretty good. <laughs> and show gallery, galleries. Galleries. <laughs> it's where I seagulls turn, eat. Or you turn British, galleries. All right, try it again. My God, this is awful.